My name is Michael Turner. I'm an MD. I grew up in California and I went to Stanford as an undergrad, studied human biology. Then I took some time off from med school actually and was a school teacher. So I was a classroom school teacher for several years, which I greatly enjoyed and which I bring into my practice uh, every day as well. I went to medical school then at Harvard and then did my residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I've been practicing in Washington State. It's been a great place to raise my family and a great place to build today what is my integrative and holistic practice to uh, help patients solve their problems, but also to promote wellness and health uh, for the best of their ability. Obviously, we see the numbers uh, from a COVID standpoint, the headlines are going in the right direction, uh, but we hear more and more about people suffering from long-term symptoms associated with, uh, you know, long-term COVID or even short-term COVID for that matter, uh, and it's still, you know, prevalent in our society. Uh, I'll take, for example, uh, former President Obama was diagnosed with uh, uh, COVID yesterday. Um, so it's still very much around, um, but we understand that you treat a lot of people who are suffering from symptoms that date back months and months. Can you talk about your approach? Uh, what do you find uh, that is working for you and your patients? And then as well, any other perspectives that you've uh, got uh, uh, through the uh, uh, lens of long-term COVID? Sure, John. Uh, well, the first thing we wanna do is if they're having any respiratory symptoms, we wanna ask the question, is there still an active COVID pneumonia going on, right? So that can be assessed partly on their clinical status, respiratory rate, O2 sats, subjective symptoms of shortness of breath, for example. And we can also get a lung CT scan if we need to. If we see ongoing respiratory problems and still some signs of a pneumonia, then we need to deal with that. Most effective typically is a course of strong anti-inflammatories like a prednisone or similar such equivalent. So that's question number one. Question number two in my mind is, how is their adrenal function? Uh, we know that the COVID virus can affect the adrenal glands. We know they can cause inflammatory damage and therefore low function of the adrenal glands. And so many times they have symptoms of low adrenal function, such as fatigue, uh, the brain fog, particularly morning fatigue. If, if you have a great night's sleep and you still wake up feeling like you're dragging, that's a cardinal sign of low adrenal function. So we can screen for their adrenal function through some common blood labs, nothing too fancy about it, but those can be highly insightful. Step three is we wanna reduce inflammation in the brain. So many of the symptoms from long COVID are driven by inflammatory or oxidative stress of the brain. This would include obviously brain fog, but things like loss of sense or taste of smell, which basically just have to do with nerves that go from your eyes or your nose or your mouth, right? To the certain centers in your brain, those are called cranial nerves, and they can undergo what we would call neuroinflammatory damage. And we wanna reverse that. So we wanna re reduce and reverse inflammation in the brain. This can be done with certain supplements like fish oil is one of my favorites. Um, NAC is another one, acetyl L-carnitine is another one, um, resveratrol is another one, or through certain medications, ivermectin for example, or the prednisone or methylprednisolone equivalents can reduce inflammation in the brain. So that's a major target. Finally, uh, we wanna improve circulation. So we also know that one of the problems is <clears throat> lack of uh, adequate circulation in the body. We know that COVID for example, predisposes towards blood clots. We know that the spike protein damages the lining of the blood vessels, what we call the endothelium. So we have endothelial damage and we have blood that has predisposition to clotting or in fact does form what we would call microclots. So we wanna reverse that process. We wanna do everything possible to improve a person's vascular status and circulatory status. So this can be done through supplements, through exercise, again, through certain medications to try to improve someone's vascular health. So those are my four uh, initial approaches. Dr. Turner, I'm just going to kind of throw this out there. What kind of success are you experiencing with your patients and uh, the, the, the four steps you kind of walked through a couple minutes ago? A good amount of success, John, thankfully. You know, I would say the positive note is if you have long COVID, by no means is it uh, an interminable sentence that, that, you know, can't be understood well and cannot be remedied. Um, there are ways to understand this disease now in terms of what I mentioned before, those types of underlying uh, pathological mechanisms, and there are certain interventions that are known to be helpful. I take my cue in large part from an organization called the FLCCC, so I highly recommend that to all of your listeners. Uh, FLCCC stands for Frontline COVID Critical Care Consortium, and uh, you can find them online. They publish protocols for treating COVID, and they have a research-based protocol for treating long COVID. It's quite effective, has a very good scientific rationale. I kind of say they're like the Wikipedia of treating COVID, essentially, and they came together as a group of 
doctors and physicians actually started in New York State, um, ICU physicians who came together and said, let's share best practices, COVID sweeping through New York, this is horrible, and how do we come together and do something rational and effective for our patients. So they moved on from there and they they now publish quite effective long haul protocols. So the short answer is I've seen, I'll just to give you an example, I had a student who was a PhD in math at UC Berkeley and had to stop out of his program because his brain frog from long COVID was so intolerable. He called me, he was home on vacation, out of state at his parents' house on sabbatical and said, if I can't solve this, I can't continue my career. We got him going. A few weeks into it, he's feeling better. I've got him on some NAC, some uh, vitamin D, the fish oil, a dose of ivermectin, a dose of methylprednisolone, some of these other things, okay? Long story short, we worked our way through this FLCCC protocol successfully to the point he's back in school, he's back in California, he's back teaching, he's finishing up his PhD program, right? So I've seen many stories like that. People can definitely get better and in many cases actually resolve the long COVID syndrome. So I'm quite optimistic about it, frankly. From your vantage point, what are kind of the top three things sort of this community should know about sleep, long-term COVID, um, and, and the, the connection to brain fog and whatnot? You know, really interesting what Dr. Uh, Eric was just mentioning there about um, the energy transfer at night. That got me thinking, you know, one of my top tips actually has to do with a restful bedtime ritual. That's what I call it, right? So I talk to people and they say, oh, doc, my sleep's terrible. I have trouble falling asleep. Well, what happens? Oh, well, my mind's racing this and that. And I go, you know, first thing we need to do is we need to get a resting bedtime ritual in place. I mean, if you've had children or you've ever taken care of kids, you know, you can't just put them right to bed, right? They can't go from running around the living room, eating sugar, playing with their friends and stuff and just tell them, okay, John, you're supposed to fall asleep now, right? And I say the same thing goes actually as adults. We just don't have anyone to tuck us in, read us a story, pat our stomach, and give us some warm milk, but we have to learn how to give ourselves a resting bedtime ritual, right? So what does that look like? It means, you know, you're not watching TV, for example, right before bed. You're not paying bills. You're not having emotionally charged discussions with your spouse or your, your children, right? You got low light conditions. You're doing something restful. You know, you're journaling. You're reading with a little nightlight. You're listening to calm music. You're soaking your feet in Epsom salts right? You're stroking your cat. I mean, this kind of thing. You need to put in place a resting bedtime ritual to help yourself transition from the day in which you are trying to solve problems and putting out energy to the night in which you are internally using your energy to recharge, right? And Dr. Eric describes it in a fantastic way. Um, we, you know, we look at it from a little different way, but it's the same idea, I think, in the end. Internally recharging in the world of Western medicine has to do with hormones that are cycling, right? So there's day and night fluctuations of certain hormones. Um, and this becomes very important, not only for brain function, but for things like the immune system and even things like weight gain. We know, for example, shift work uh, people have tend to gain weight. The longer you're on a shift work schedule and your sleep's disturbed, you can just watch people start to gain X number of pounds every month. And it just goes on indefinitely uh, because they've disturbed the hormonal balance that's gone on there. So when I talk about practical applications for sleep, I talk about restful bedtime ritual. Number two, I talk about the conditions of sleep. It needs to be like a tomb, okay, a tomb. A tomb is cold, it's dark, and it's quiet. That's what you need to get deep sleep. <laughs> and optimal sleep is about 66 degrees. It needs to be dark, it needs to be quiet. I encourage eye shades, blackout curtains, that kind of thing. And then finally, I tell people that they should research and understand the concept of slow wave sleep, right? Not everybody has heard that phrase, but everybody should. There are different stages of sleep, as you may know, and the deepest, most restorative stage is called slow wave sleep. So everyone needs to take time, if they're interested in health promotion, to understand even better to document and even better to improve their slow wave sleep. This is where growth hormone gets released, for example. This is where toxins are most efficiently flushed out of the brain. So for example, a lack of slow wave sleep or a lack of deep sleep is positively correlated with Alzheimer's disease. This is well known for a number of years now. You can, they've tracked people, let's say, you know, at age 50, 60, and they look at their sleep and the people with the most disturbed sleep have the highest rates of developing Alzheimer's than over the next 10, 15 years. This has been well studied. So those are some of my top suggestions. And there are ways specifically to increase slow wave sleep, whether through exercise, supplements, certain medications, but that's the broad idea. Dr. Turner, uh, just kind of some thoughts from you and from your experience and your recommendations as an MD. You want to talk a little bit about immunity and, and kind of what should we be thinking about right now? Sure, happy to. The first concept I want to understand is that when you sleep, there's a massive cellular turnover and renewal that is happening. 
right? Let's just ask the question on a typical daily basis, how many new cells get created in your body? The answer is larger than most people would think. The number is 300 billion with a B. Okay? <laughs> on a typical day, there's 300 billion new cells getting created in your body. Now, you can imagine that part of those cells are cells of the immune system, vitally important. Okay? Therefore, if you are lacking sleep, you are not getting the cellular turnover of your immune system to keep it on levels where it needs to be. One of the most notable studies that I reference on my webpage and in my blog, for example, they took perfectly healthy, perfectly well-rested people, okay, no sleep debt, no sicknesses, no symptoms. Just for one night, they restricted them to four hours of sleep, okay? They got them up, drew their blood, isolated one of their most important white blood cells, which is called the natural killer cell which has a role not only in infections, but against cancer. It's a potent anti-cancer cell as well. They isolated the natural killer cell, put it in a Petri dish, and then bombarded it with different kinds of viruses to ba and bacteria to see how active it would be. And the punchline is after just one night of four hours of sleep, natural killer cell activity had declined by 30%, okay? To me, that's striking, right? Their, their most important immune cell arguably was down 30% in its function after just one night of restricted sleep. What would that mean for a week or two weeks, or a month, or a lifestyle of poor sleep? And the answer is your immune system is just running into the ground. The metaphor I would use with my patients is it's like RPMs. You know, you want your immune system up in the high RPM zone, and you're just running on first or second gear. And uh, this becomes even more important when you get sick. So again, let's just use the question of an infection. It could be COVID or whatever. What's happening when you have a viral infection? Well, the virus hijacks the machinery of the cell, takes it over, tells it to stop doing whatever it was doing and tells it to make more virus, okay, pretty nasty. Then it blows up the cell and releases billions of viral particles into circulation to do the same exact thing, infect nearby cells to take them over to produce more virus to release into circulation. So you can imagine the doubling time of viral load once this thing gets underway, okay? So that the question is, what's your immune system trying to do? If the virus has its doubling rate, your immune system has to have its own doubling rate. And if it can't keep up, you have a spreading virus. And so in very stark terms, um, it's a numbers game, right? And either the virus overwhelms the body or the immune system overwhelms the virus. But in the end, only one person's standing and one person's going out. And so when you are asleep, your bone marrow is literally furiously pumping out new antibodies, new white blood cells, putting them into circulation, trying to keep up with that viral doubling rate. And you think when you're fighting an infection, you think, oh, I'm fighting this infection all day long, but it's not quite like that. It's heavily weighted towards sleep, right? Just to put a number and a concept out there, we'll use the 80-20 rule. Let's just say 80% of you fighting the virus happens during your sleep time uh, in a concentrated format. It's very, very much weighted. So when you are asleep, I want you to imagine that your bone marrow is furiously working hard to pump out new cells to keep up with the virus and its doubling rate, and it's trying to take over your body, essentially. And uh, that kind of puts a, a new point of emphasis on it for most people. With that, we're out of time. Uh, Dr. Turner, any final thoughts? Uh, and how can we learn more about you? And, and where can people read more about some of the things you've talked about? Sure. Thank you, John. Uh, glad to help. Um, my website would be the best way. So it's michaelturnermd.com. It's all one word, all lowercase. And I develop personalized, integrative solutions to help people live in their best state of health. And I draw on my experiences as a physician, obviously, but also as a teacher and just someone who's personally uh, a high level athlete and very interested in health and wellness and fitness myself. So I enjoy what I do and I appreciate the chance to talk with you all today to share this with your community. And if I can be of assistance in some way, I'm glad to do it. I work with patients all over the country, literally Hawaii to Florida to Maine, to Minnesota, to Texas and all parts in between. So I do a lot of telemedicine through Zoom or phone calls. And so that's no barrier if people want to work with me, I'd be glad to help.